Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. It is so good to be able to join with you here at Spirit of Joy. I'm Pastor Ed Thomas. It is Easter Sunday morning. We are so glad that you can worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, resurrected and reigning. Today, really not any significant announcements. I, I just want to tell you that I am so proud of our congregation. Uh, you have a staff that is just working hard, finding new and creative ways in, in order to minister more effectively to you. Your, your council is taking steps that, that set us up in the short run and in the long run. And all of you, you are generous. You are giving. You are, are helping and encouraging. I can't tell you how much the encouragement blesses each of us. We are just so fortunate here as a congregation. Now, as we begin, I want to just turn you very quickly in prayer toward everything that is going on. Uh, pray for our world. Pray for those affected by the virus. In our church, we're beginning to get people who are losing jobs and are getting their hours cut. And so pray for them. Pray for people who are sick with all kinds of other things other than a virus. And some of them are pretty bad. It's, it is scary right now as we are, are just, we have people that are diagnosed with cancer who are struggling in health. We did another funeral this week, this time for Cindy Lillis' sister-in-law. Be very prayerful. Uh, for our world, for our church in the midst of all of this. But mainly, we're just here to worship our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Easter Gospel, Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has been raised. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray this Easter. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, risen and reigning. Lord, open our hearts as you once opened the empty tomb so that we may worship with you and know you and follow you always. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We gather here today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into you and fellowship with you, and you shall enjoy fellowship with me. We trust in you, for you alone are worthy. Let us bow our hearts in confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sin. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We trust in you. Do you feel the world is broken? 
the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and eternal God, you are worthy of all praise. We give you humble thanks for the immeasurable blessings that you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Eternal God, protect your holy church throughout the world from the threat of terrorist threats or governmental oppression. Grant each Christian and every congregation integrity of doctrine, empowering us to reflect the light of your gospel into a darkened world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Compassionate Lord, the church's constant prayer throughout the ages has been for you to graciously defend us from all calamity in this season of disease and dis-ease. Guard our health, guide our spirits, and help us each to pray with the psalmist, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, as we trust that you are watching over each of us, consecrate our bodies and souls, hearts and minds, gifts and talents to your service. Make us generous, clothe us with compassion, and guide our steps. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our prayer. prayer. O oh God of comfort and strength, as quarantines and disease affects our nation and our world, we pray for the elderly, the infirmed, and for each vulnerable member of our community, for all health care providers as they minister on the front lines, for government officials to make wise decisions, for those worried about jobs and finances, for the millions around us who don't know you and don't have a foundation of hope. And for you, O oh Lord, be merciful to this broken world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty Father, this is but the beginning of our prayer time this day. May we each continue to pray in our own homes for those with other illnesses that are crippling their health for those dealing with discouragement and depression, for families who are hurting and grieving, for the poor and homeless, the lonely and neglected, for those who are battling addiction, for revival, renewal, for guidance in thanksgiving and grounded in praise. We have so much to pray for, generous Lord. We come to you trusting in your unending care. And so, we continue praying around our tables and in our homes. Our first lesson for this Easter Sunday morning is from Colossians, the third chapter. The Apostle Paul writes, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson for this Easter Sunday is from Psalm 116. If you have this at home, let us read it responsively. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. 
I have a goodly heritage. Bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy in your right hand are pleasures forevermore this is the word of the lord thanks be to god now before we read our gospel lesson and start our sermon for today we recorded our choir did practicing social distancing a few weeks ago they recorded an anthem for easter Unfortunately, after we recorded, after everyone left, after the shutdown began, we found there was a glitch in the recording. So what we have are just a few lines from the beginning of the song, but those lines right there are going to set up everything in the sermon for today. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't you remember what the Master said? That he would rise again. The Easter Gospel, Luke, the 24th chapter. And because we've read this already in the service, I'm going to read just a portion and breaking form, I'm going to stop and make a comment as we go through. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And then they began to encounter four surprises. First verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Second surprise, when they went in, they did not find the body. Third surprise, while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them, and the women were terrified, and they bowed their faces to the ground. That's the third surprise. And the third one is not so much a surprise, as it is a life-changing question. It says the women were terrified. They bowed their faces to the ground, but the men, the angels, said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has been raised. The gospel of the Lord. So, the stone was rolled away. Stones are our theme for today. Specifically, tomb stones. I don't know what you think about when you think about tombstones, but I heard an example from, and I want you to kind of picture this, get this in your mind. It was in a cemetery in Springdale, Ohio. And the inscription on the tombstone reads, Here lies Jamie Smith, wife of Thomas Smith, marble cutter. This monument was erected by her husband as a tribute to her memory and as a specimen of his work. Monuments of the same style, $350. <laughs> Tombstones. That is our theme for today. Specifically, it is stones that have been rolled away. How many of you have ever thought in your life that kind of all of human history ends with a tombstone? Maybe our lives end with a tombstone. 
That's kind of our way of thinking about this world. But the Apostle Peter tells us, 1 Peter 4, that because of Easter, we don't come to a tombstone. But, and here's his words, to the living stone, which is Jesus Christ. Easter, indeed, is the feast of tombstones being moved away. Well, we have a big question here as we begin this day of Easter. And that is, if Jesus is life, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, then why do we keep looking for life in all the wrong places? I begin thinking about this. I've been thinking about the stones, the tombstones that were buried beneath. How many people do you know that seek as the goal in their life to build kind of personal monuments to themselves, to their success, to their accomplishments? There's a little pride in there. There's a little desire for recognition. Many people think that they've become successful if they have enough money and they build kind of altars of sorts to their wealth. But you know what the angels would say to this? Why do you seek the living among the things that are dead? There's another tomb that many of us got, get caught in. See if, if this has snagged you ever before. And that is the tomb of work. Now some people are in this tomb of work, they're sealed in, they don't even get to see their family sometimes because they are so focused on what they can accomplish. Kind of like the last one, they're, they're interested in building a personal monument to themselves. Other people get caught in this tomb of work out of fear. Am I going to have enough money? to make ends meet? Am I going to keep this job? Am I going to lose this job? Can I pay the mortgage? But either way, our jobs can be to become a tombstone that we are living under. And can't you say the, see the angels coming up to us and saying, why are you seeking the living among another thing that is dead? Why? And that's the question. Why do we keep seeking life in all the wrong places? King Solomon did that once. King Solomon was maybe the richest man in history. And yet, he begins his book called Ecclesiastes with the word saying, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is just meaningless. And so throughout the book, he kind of makes a test of things. He's trying to find out what in his life might not be meaningless. And so at the beginning of chapter 2, he gives an example. He says, so I made a test of pleasure. How many of us have sought kind of our hopes and our affirmations and meaning in life in pleasure. Now some of it's kind of innocent pleasure, a lot of recreation is this way, and, and we do need to refresh ourselves occasionally, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And then there are the sinful kind of pleasures that many people partake of. It gives a moment of fun, of a thrill, of something, but in the end, it leaves us more empty than when we started. And so here we are with the angels whispering to us again, why do you keep seeking the living among the dead? How about entertainment? I found this quote and it, it just kind of grabbed me. It says, one of the things, one of the ways we look for life is through entertainment. 
We go to movies and ball games, concerts and horse races, and God only knows what else trying to be entertained. We play video games and surf the internet and Twitter, and we text our friends as if there is no tomorrow. We watch television for hours on end. We have an insatiable appetite for entertainment. But at the end of the day, how often are we left empty and unfulfilled? It's not that any of these forms of entertainment are essentially bad. It's just that they give us just barely a temporary fix at best. They're not the source of the true abundant life. One of the greatest books at the end of the 20th century, almost 25, 30 years ago now, uh, was almost prophetic. Neil Postman was beginning to describe more and more what was going to happen in our culture. And he named his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. We essentially bury ourselves under distractions and we miss that abundant life. So, what were those angels saying? Why do you seek the living among the dead? There's so much discouragement in our world. There is so much hopelessness. Ask your teens, there is so much boredom. There's so much failure. And how often do we just chase after whatever fills that void? You know, it was one of the saints, St. Saint Augustine, that said, essentially, we have this God-shaped hole in our hearts. And his words were, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. But how many times do we bury ourselves under a tombstone of whatever seems to fill the void? Now, one of the ways that people have sought meaning over the years is by thinking things through. I'm glad I have uh, our friend from here at Spirit of Joy, David Roberts, uh, who's taught me that there is a good side to philosophy. But there are some not so good sides to philosophy. There are not so good things to some people's worldview. We all have to make sense of the world somehow. But not every way of thinking brings life. And so I want you to see if you can identify who wrote this famous quote probably about a century ago. It was a philosopher. But see if you can identify it. Here's the quote. The life of man is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes and tortured by weariness and pain. We journey on and on towards a goal that we'll probably never reach. And one by one, as we march, our comrades keep vanishing from sight, seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death. Now, that's a hap happy worldview, isn't it? Hopeful, too. You know who said it? It was Bertrand Russell. He was a famous philosopher and a famous atheist. He had no hope, just omnipotent death. Clearly, he was, I guess he wasn't even seeking the living. He was just finding death. Now that was like a hundred years ago, 150 years ago on Easter Sunday evening, there was a pastor named Sidney Partridge who was preaching in Shanghai, China. And, and listen to how he reflects on some of the failures of the philosophies of his day. But yet, that part of us that's drawn to something that doesn't give us life. So he says, 
and see if you can hear our why do you seek the living among the dead as, as he starts his phrase. How often do we seek life for ourselves amid the dead philosophies and speculations of men? He says, we look for something that has just enough brazen assurance probably to make us feel good. Just enough cool intellectual conceit and just enough mystifying terminology to sound important that conceals, though, the wolf in sheep's clothing. So much of this is dragged out of the groves of ancient thoughts like mummies from their tombs. But it's galvanized with a little wit, a little satire, and often a little cheap profanity. It's wrapped in flimsy garments of quasi-scientific phraseology, which makes the popular secular eye and mind mistake it for having brains. These forlorn and pitiable objects are the substitutes which modern infidelity offers instead of faith in the living God. Substitutes that are dead for the living faith in Jesus Christ. Why are we seeking the living among the dead? Or maybe to put it another way, why do people keep finding that which is dead when there is so much that is alive? Christ is risen in our midst, and yet people keep finding only death. How come? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus also said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That is the offer. Here is the one who keeps removing tombstones. And yet how many people keep settling for lifelessness? Or even us Christians. How many of us keep settling for less life than Jesus is truly offering? Now, I want to tell you the story. From Good Friday to Easter Sunday morning, and you basically know this story, but I want to tell it in a way that you've probably never heard it before. It starts in a very familiar place. They let him out to the place that is called the skull. And there they crucified him between the two criminals. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God! Why have you forsaken me? And then he breathed his last. Now in the midst of the crowd, there were people there that were surely looking up and saying, he's dead. I think he's dead. There were probably the, the chief priests and the elders that were standing there with a self-satisfied smirk. He's dead. <laughs> Thankfully, he's dead. The Roman soldiers came, and they had the club to break his legs to accelerate the process of death. But as they got ready to swing, they looked up, and they said, he's dead. But just to make sure, one of them took a spear and jabbed it into his side. Blood and water washed out together. And they said, he's dead. He's dead. 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, was standing there watching her son's lifeless form and crying, he's dead, he's dead. Mary Magdalene and the other followers, almost inconsolable, he's dead. The centurion went back to report to Pilate and his only words were, Sir, he's dead. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they took the body down from the cross. They wrapped it in linen cloths and laid Jesus in the tomb because he's dead. Early that Sunday morning, the women went out to the tomb carrying spices, knowing what they would find because he's dead. But then suddenly, two angels appeared. And they changed everything. They said, he is not dead. He is alive. They said to them, so why do you keep seeking the living among the dead? That was their question. Peter, 50 days later, the day of Pentecost, Peter the denier was now Peter the rock, standing in the middle of murderous Jerusalem, saying, he is not dead, he is alive. I love the words of John the Apostle. The first words of Revelation that describe Jesus' eternal identity. It says, John says, I heard a great voice behind me as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And I looked and there in the midst of the seven lampstands stood one like the Son of Man. His head was white like wool. His eyes were aflame. His feet were brass. His voice the sound of many waters. In his right hand were the seven stars. And his countenance was like that of the sun. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his hand on me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the one who lives, and I have the keys of death and the grave. Easter is the celebration of tombstones roll away. I want to ask you just very quickly, what are those tombstones in your life? Are you building personal monuments? Are you buried under the need to be entertained? Are you buried under fear? You know the tombstone in your life. You know what it is that you use as a cheap excuse to fill the void. And I tell you what, that question, what is that tombstone that is robbing you of life is more important right now, more meaningful, more pressing than maybe it's been in a long time. Right now, our current world situation is a mess. Viruses are swirling, economies are, are going down, anxiety is going up. Where do you stand in the midst of this world right here, right now? Well, I want to kind of give you just a little bit of a window on how to look at what Easter is saying to us in the midst of this current world that we are living in. 
And I want to do it kind of like this. I want to set it into a pattern. And I want to tell you that Easter removes the tombstone of, and then it's something that's not good or, or not life-giving, but it opens the gate to something that does bring life. Okay? So let's take a look at this. What was the meaning of Easter? Well, first, Easter removed the tombstone of crucifixion and opened the gate to resurrection. It removed the tombstone of death and opened the gate to eternal life. And tell you something, I've done a whole lot of funerals lately. I'm tired of death. That's the tombstone that needs rolled away. And I am ready and hungry for life. And I told you last week, every time I've done a funeral, I've seen a glimpse. God has spoken somehow, some way, somewhere along the journey that has convinced me that the tombstone of death does not have the final word. But I am thankful for the open gate to life. There's a couple more. Easter removes the tombstone of grief. Anybody been there? And opens the gate to joy. Now, sometimes it's a journey. It doesn't just happen overnight. But because Christ has risen, we have a hope. It says we said last week, quoting 1 Thessalonians 4, we don't need to grieve like the rest of the world. Sure, we will grieve but we'll only grieve with one eye on the world, but the other eye in heaven. Why do you seek the living among the dead? There is hope. Yes, Easter removes dead tombstones. You ready for them to be removed? And opens the gate to, well, I want to give you two more. And, and I, I tell you intentionally, that I got some of the imagery here, just a little bit of it, from an African pastor who's actually working in D.C. now, but an African pastor whose name I'm going to completely butcher. I think it's like Thabiti Abigail. Anyway, butchered it completely. But he says something from a number of years ago that applies to today. And I want to tell you this was from a number of years ago because... It's so poignant to where we are right now. He says, and get this, that Easter removes the tombstones of current events. How many of you, in the midst, overwhelmed, buried under the tombstones of current events? But Easter, he says, removes those tombstones and opens the gate to God's provision. I love that. Think of the women going to the tomb that day. They knew the current events. They had been there. They had seen the crucifixion, and they knew he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. That was it. They knew the current events. Except they were about an hour behind the current events because Jesus had now risen. But they were, were so wrapped up in what they thought the world was telling them, that they missed God's activity in their lives. In fact, they showed up at the tomb, and they missed it. The stone was rolled away. Why? They missed it. They went into the tomb, and there were just linen wrappings laying there. They missed it again. Suddenly, angels appear. It would seem like they ought to be getting a clue, but they were so captive to what they thought the world was telling them that they missed God's provision. How many of you along your journey have been shut in for a while? You've been weighed down. My guess is many of us have watched way more Netflix, read way more books, and played way more games than we ever expected to do in these last few months. And, you know, we wanted a few days off. But this is dragging on and on. And like those tombstones, 
those things aren't giving us life. How many of you are, are ready for something deeper? You're hungry for meaning and purpose again. This is where I invite you in the midst of current events to dive back into Scripture. I mean, how many stories in the Bible and, and even how many Psalms begin with trial, trouble, disaster, enemy armies, and yet end with God's provision, end with faith and trust and hope. This is where the life is, but the story begins over here. How many of you, we're not the first people who've ever endured a pandemic. I mean, how deadly was the Black Plague? And there have been wars and disasters, world wars that have been around us. And so I urge people sometimes read Christian biographies, stories of people like Corey Ten Boom's The Hiding Place, of people enduring hard times and yet seeing God's provision. Isn't that a miracle of Easter? I love this one. Easter removes the tombstones of current events and opens the gates to God's providence. Remember our first lesson for today? Colossians 3. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Yes, Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died. He's talking about a spiritual death here. And your true life, your spiritual life, your true life is hidden with Christ in God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the current events and the things of earth because Easter has come to roll them away. Now, there's one more, one last one as we finish here. Easter removes the tombstone, and this was written, remember, several years ago, of feelings and focuses us on the truth of God. That is the gift. Now, Feelings, every one of us has them, right? God gave us the ability to feel things. In fact, God feels. Uh, God came down in human flesh to take on our bodies, including feelings. Jesus wept at the tomb. I'm not knocking feelings. Please understand that. But remember what I said last week? I said our response to certain things in the world is kind of like this. And I said, why do I kind of separate it? It's because this is where we are on our own ability. Some of us have the ability to, to feel and handle some things better than others. And it's not a judgment. It's, it's how God made us. It's situations in our past that determine that. So wherever you are, this is your native ability. But this is you with God. I told you, if anybody says, well, why are you so worried about anything? Just say, imagine how I'd be without God in my life. Thanks be to God. So this is who you are on your own. This is who you are with God. And this is the gift of Easter. Easter came to roll away the stone, tombstone of being ruled by feelings. Again, go back to the women at the tomb. They knew only one reality and couldn't see anything beyond their feelings. It was just, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And the angels had to keep coming and showing up and showing sign and saying, why do you keep seeking the living among the dead? It's because I'm so caught up in my feelings. Now, it's telling you to escape that, that's, that's easier said than done. We all have these swirling emotions. But I want you to listen to the voice of heaven. Because Easter comes to us. 
in the midst of whatever our brokenness is. And God wants to roll aside the stone. And he wants to proclaim, not only is he risen, but when you trust in me, you can be risen more too. That's the gift of Easter. We are broken on our own, but it's time. It is gloriously time to quit seeking the living among the dead and find the living with the one who is truly living. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for Easter, and Lord, we remember your pattern, that in order to rise, we must first die. Lord, help us to die to all that is holding us down and quelching our spirit. Lord, help roll away those tombstones and open the gate to a more abundant life. Lord, you are the provider. You are the victory. You are the life. And we come to you today confident because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. up your hearts. We live to the Lord. 
let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give our thanks to you, Holy Father, Almighty, ever-living God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may commune at home. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Glory, glory.
praises now we bring, and with the heavenly blessed sing, Christ has triumphed, Alleluia. 